Financial Thing Studios is the peer-to-peer lending essentials podcast. Welcome to the Financial Thing Peer-to-Peer Lending Essentials Podcast. I am your ever-lovable host, Lawrence Samuels, here with you today. And uh, this podcast is designed to keep you up to date on all the things peer-to-peer lending and crowdfunding with the latest news. Today, as always, I have a very, very special guest for you. Now, um, this is a company that I personally haven't invested through, but I have been keeping an eye on for a long time. It's just... um, I've never invested any money with the house crowd. So this is somebody that I'm very interested in talking to and learning more about the company and what they're doing. I have today for you CEO of the house crowd. His name is Frazier Fernhead and uh, grateful to have him on the show. How are you doing today, Frazier? Hi, I'm very, very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good, Lawrence. good. Did I pronounce your name correctly, first of all? Uh, no, I'm not Kelsey Grammer. It's actually Fraser rather than Frazier. Fraser. It's America, yeah, American sensei Frazier, but it's uh, yeah, it's Scottish Fraser. Okay, okay, Fraser. I will remember that. I do have a bit of a habit of butchering people's <laughs> names, so that's all right. No worries. <laughs> I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, so I wanted to tell you a funny story that happened to me a couple of days ago. You you might get a kick out of this. So I'm based over here in Orlando at the moment, sunny Florida, and over in America. Are you a football fan? Um, uh, not as much as I used to be. I, I sort of follow Manchester United, but not not particularly. Okay. Um, I've I've never been a, a football fan. I don't think I've ever been to a football game in my entire life, which is a really strange thing for an Englishman to say. So in Orlando, we've got a new franchise here. It's the Major League Soccer is the uh, football association, and Orlando has a new team with a brand new football stadium. They opened a twenty two thousand stadium and it's extremely popular over here so my wife and i we got season tickets to the game and we went to our first match a couple of days ago on sunday at the back of the stadium they have this thing called the wall and i think they modeled it off the Bundesliga. you know it's a it's the only standing section in the whole of the mls in the whole country and the supporters are absolutely nuts they're waving flags they've got the drums they're doing the chants just like they do in the Uh, some of the European soccer uh, games. They're very fanatical. So I was walking through the stadium and I was wearing my Grimsby Town football club (laughs) shirt, right? And this guy says to me, oh, Grimsby, he knew knew the shirt. And he was an Englishman. He lives actually uh, over here part-time and over in England part-time. And we were talking about the website, financial thing, and then talking about the house crowd. And he said to me, oh, I invested in that company and have some ownership of of some of the equity property shares. I thought it was really random. I thought you might like to know that. Wow. That's something. We're we're everywhere now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, what are the odds? And he was from Derbyshire. So. um, Well, absolutely. We've only, I mean, we've got about 1,600 actual investors. Um, So, yeah, meeting one is probably very rare occurrence yeah especially over here at that in that uh, football stadium so um i thought you might like to know that now fraser i'm, I'm really going to try to work on getting that right you're based up in manchester um, is that correct yeah it's a place called hale in altrincham which is um south manchester just about half an hour outside the city center okay and are you um how long have you been based up there is that where you're from originally um, yeah, I was I was born about five minutes up the road. Um, I moved to London for about 12, 12 years and then um, moved back here after I got married. You recently wrote a book titled The Alternative Guide to Property Investing. And I've yeah. written a couple of books. I know what it's like. It's not an easy task. Why well, did you decide to write that book? Well, I've, I've always loved writing. I've, I've previously written a novel which is um, set around here called The Cheshire Sect. But this this book obviously comes out of my business activity for the house crowd. Um, I think the alternative finance industry, property, you know, crowdfunding, property crowdfunding, peer to peer lending, it's very new, but it offers um, potentially a great way for people to provide a better financial future for themselves. But you know, not many people know about it, and those that have heard about it don't really know how it works. So I just wanted to 
so it's, you know, to me, it's relatively simple. And once you understand it, it's relatively simple. But I just wanted to um, create something written in layman's terms that everyone can understand that explains how you can go about it, how you can choose your investments, how you can mitigate your risks, the difference between different sorts of investments, how to choose the right platform to work on, and just give people an overall um, you know, basic understanding of it. It's not a complicated book. It's, it's very written in a very down-to-earth fashion. Um, and that was the reason for it. Okay. How, how long did it take you to write that book? Um, I don't know, three, three months, something like that, on and off. Obviously, I'm, I'm running a company at the same time, so it was very much in my spare time, mm -hmm. um, just taking a day off here and there to, to write it. I um, had got quite a lot of the material already because I, I frequently write blog posts for mm -hmm. Uh, companies like Right Move or What House and things like that. So I kind of, you know, I had some other material there already. So it didn't didn't take me that long. I, I was going to get very mad at you if you said it took you three weeks because uh, I remember it took me probably <laughs> a year to write the books. Oh, it, it took me three years to write my novel, but look, this is a whole <laughs> different kettle of fish. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it all evens out and averages out over the long run. Um, yeah. What I really liked about your book, Fraser, was the. Uh, little intro about you and and your past life. I thought it was very interesting. And personally, I've worked in the music business myself, so I was able to connect with some of the things you were talking about. What was it like for you working in the music business? Um, it was it was great. You know, it was it was cool Britannia. It was the early nineties. It's Oasis and Blur and Suede and kind of you know really really great bands. Um, so I was living in London, going to lots of parties, um, going to too many parties according to my boss, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was good. You know, for a while it was I was young. It was exciting. I guess after a while it be becomes very samey. Um, got lots of kind of stories to tell involving various celebrities and stuff. But um, ultimately, I think being a lawyer, despite having kind of you know interesting clients, wasn't for me. It was dotting the i's and crossing the t's for other people's dreams and what they wanted to do. Um, and you know, it was, I've always been entrepreneurial, and it, it wasn't. I kind of fell into it. Um, and it just wasn't. It wasn't for me in the end. Um, so I, I decided to to pack it in and start up um, on my own. I've been working for myself since, or running my own company since um, 1999 or 2000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I often write on the website about finding your purpose in life and really trying to enjoy what you do. And a, a lot of people they get put into these careers that they you know they like it but they don't it doesn't really get them up in the morning get them excited so I'm sure a lot of yeah. people relate to that it was you know it, I went to a very academic school and it really was you know do you want to be an accountant a doctor a dentist or, or a lawyer and I wasn't really aware of other opportunities um I said I didn't I, I fell into it through lack of having any idea what I really wanted to do it just it seemed to be not push down that path. There was no pressure on me, but it seemed like um, a vaguely interesting thing to do, um, and it gave me a way to work in the entertainment industry, which I suppose I did want to do at the time. Fraser, you mentioned some of the financial struggles that you've been through in your past, uh, going from driving an Aston Martin to struggling just to pay the electricity <laughs> bill. It, it wasn't actually quite that good. I never actually got. I, I never actually got to drive the Aston Martin. I just put a deposit down on it. But by, it took. It had about six months to build it because it was a new model. And then by the time it was, I was ready to buy it. I couldn't afford to buy it anymore. So I never actually got to drive it. I did see a picture of it though. <laughs> did, did you get to test drive one at least? Oh yeah, I test drove one. But I've I've got a very nice car. I'm happy with now. So there we go. It all works out in the end. <laughs> How were you able to climb out of those financial struggles that you went through? Um. Well, it was a very, very tough time. I, I basically, when the property market crashed, I was owed an awful lot of money. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds um, in commissions from developments we'd we'd sold. And foolishly, I'd kind of been spending or living a lifestyle in the expectation of getting that money. But with developers going bust, I never had it. So, I never actually obtained it. So, you know, that, you, you live and learn anyway. I'm a lot more cautious these days. Um, so essentially I had very big overheads and no job. I was virtually unemployable having worked for myself for, you know, probably um, at the time, the last eight, eight years or so um, at that time. So I, I consulted for other businesses on building, um, doing their marketing and branding, which paid reasonably well. I started, I don't know if you're familiar with the 
landlord legislation that came in here regarding tenancy deposits um, around that time, around 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. But it became it became increasingly important for landlords to have inventories done of their property so they could prove that the tenant had committed the damage. The onus was very much put on landlords to do that. So I started a company called the Video Inventory um, Agency. I created a franchise operation out of that, um, sold 42 franchises for that, and then then kind of sold sold the company on to somebody else. Um, so that helped a little bit. Um, and then really, I, I suppose it was just getting back into property investment. I was contacted by some of my old clients from my previous property investment consultancy started sourcing um, repossessed properties for them and you know high yielding properties in the Northwest. And that's really where the idea for the house crowd came about because although some of those people had hundreds of thousands of pounds ready to invest, others didn't and they were finding it very hard to get mortgages or to quali qualify for mortgages or raise the deposits necessary. So that's really where the idea came about to kind of cut out the banks, crowd people together and invest, you know, for mutual profit. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, the last the last five years, it's we didn't really pay ourselves much in the first two or three years. But, you know, the company's doing well now. It's it's, it's fairly profitable and um, things are things are going pretty well. It's, when you were going through these financial distresses, did you ever consider going back to law just for income reasons? <laughs> Not even in my deepest, darkest hours. <laughs> and there were lots of those. Um, I, it may well have crossed my mind uh, very briefly, but no, not really. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter was the music industry is very specialised. All the work I'd done was very specialised. It was ba it's all wholly based in London. I was then living in Manchester. It wouldn't have been practical even if I'd wanted to. You know, the music industry has changed massively since I left it. I mean, you, you know, pe people... I don't even think Napster existed, and certainly the people streaming things or downloading them off the internet was really not prevalent at all whilst I was working in the music industry. Yeah. So it's changed enormously. It just would not have been a practical thing to do. I used to be an A&R director for a music distribution company, so I'm well familiar at the end of the 1990s when we were selling a lot of vinyl, when things switched to the electronic. I mean, it just destroyed the business. If you weren't on board quickly, uh, everything mm. just changed so fast, so I, I definitely relate to what you're saying. Have to touch on this. Everybody knows you were on the Dragon's Den. Um, right. So basically, you have an income of 375000 Mm-hmm. What's your profit? We haven't made a profit as yet. Oh, you haven't made a profit? Correct. Whoa. I don't get it, Fraser. There's got to be a reason why you've done this. Did you want you did you want this to happen? No, not at all. Fraser, I don't need you to hear any more. Um, it's I, I'm incredibly upset about the valuation and and, um, and disappointed, but I'm out too. I thought the the episode portrayed you as uh, somewhat nervous. I'm sure it's not an easy thing to do to stand there in front of those people who are dissecting every little thing that you say and do and uh, trying to make also for a good television show. Uh, what was that experience like for you? And were you happy that you did not receive an offer from the Dragons? Um, I suppose it was akin to being cannon fodder. <laughs> In many ways, you you know you're there for the ent for the purpose of the TV show, not to get not to raise money. As far as they're concerned, you're there for entertainment value. Um, fortunately, I wasn't there to raise the money either, um, so it, it, it was mutually beneficial. I, w I went on to the show asking for four times more money than anybody else had ever asked for. My name is Fraser Fernhead. I'm the founder of the House Crowd, the UK's leading property crowdfunding platform, and today. I'm asking you for a £1 million investment in exchange for 5% of my company. There was no chance anyone was ever going to give it me. We weren't under any illusions about that. But the purpose of going on the show was to get the concept of property crowdfunding out to a much wider audience. And, you know, as far as that went, we were very successful. We, we, that, that month, July, is still our highest um, month in terms of website traffic. We had four or 5,000 extra visitors just in the two days immediately following the show. 
it's obviously repeated a lot on TV. So, you know, they, they say there's no publicity is bad publicity. It wasn't by any means a pleasant experience. Um, if you can imagine, I arrived there prior to six o'clock in the morning, I kept waiting in a green room till five o'clock at night when you went in and filmed it. There's about 30 people, kind of crew, camera crew, and what have you, standing on one side of you, staring at you. Um, you have to stand on an X spot on the floor and stare at these five people who have been massively belligerent. I mean, just unnecessarily vitriolic, um, just for the sake of good TV. And it was difficult. You know, I, I personally think, yes, I was, I may have looked nervous, but I think my main thing was struggling to keep my temper because when someone's been just bullying and dogmatic and refusing to to listen to what you're saying it's just very frustrating at the end of the day I just shut up and stopped talking um because there just wasn't any point in, in I wasn't going to get the money um wasn't going to change their mind about anything they weren't even listening so I just shut up in the end so I was in there for about 50 minutes and that got edited down to about eight minutes but I think the interesting thing for me was how people reacted to it afterwards I mean there's a huge disparity um, of people some people I got I got really vitriolic horrible hate mail um, which was just unbelievable why someone would get that bothered by someone else's appearance on TV mm -hmm. and then I had really nicely I, I was in London for a conference the following week and must have had 20 or 30 people come up to me and shake my hand in the street people I'd never met before who <laughs> recognized me either there or, or in restaurants um, even a couple of weeks later, I was traveling down to Devon, I think, and someone came up to me in a pub in Devon and sort of said, oh, well done sort of thing. So I think a lot of people out there appreciated the fact I stood up to them and didn't back down. Um, and then you've got other people going, what a ridiculous valuation. Who does he think he is? Well, you know, <laughs> people are going, How do, why do you think you, your company's not worth 20 million? Well, well so my view to them is, well, you tell me what you think it's worth then because we did go ahead and we did raise a million pounds based on that 20 million pound valuation and if you take the view that something is worth what people are prepared to pay for it then the company is worth 20 million and the proof of that was in what we've achieved so if rewind for some reason one of the dragons did give you an offer that was a reasonable offer would you have accepted it at that point i told the producer of the show before we went in we weren't prepared to i wasn't prepared to negotiate it was that simple. I didn't expect to get their money. I didn't particularly want their money because I'm well aware of all the onerous clauses and conditions that come with an investment from the Dragons. Um, and I think apart from Nick, oh, I've forgotten his second name, the chap who invested in Moonpig um, or started Moonpig, who was one of the Dragons at the time, he was really the only sensible choice for us, someone who could have added something to the business. The reason that they wanted companies like ours on board, more tech companies, is because the Dragons are trying to move towards being more contemporary and have more tech companies on there, but they clearly don't understand tech investments. Peter Jones is trying to value my investment in the same way you would value a retail business on a, a, a price-to-earnings ratio rather than the way many tech companies are valued. You know, he, he, he basically, his whole argument would mean that Amazon, until very recently at least, is worthless, that Facebook, until five years ago, was worthless. If, you, if you're basing on the profit and solely on the profit the company is currently producing, then many tech companies are worthless. As yeah. we know, Snap, Snapchat's just gone for, what, how many, 23 billion or something? Yeah, yeah. So there are different ways to value businesses, but he just completely refused to accept that. And you know, if that's the way he's, he looks at things and that's the way he values a business, then that's great for him. But he, he just refused to admit there are other ways to do it as well, which was, frustrating, which was frustrating. And let me just say also for the people that are listening in America that Dragon's Den is the uh, UK version of the Shark Tank, which, which uh, they have over in America. So some people may not know that. Uh, Fraser, do you actually personally invest in peer-to-peer -peer lending as outside of the house crowd yourself, or have you ever done that? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I put most of my money in my own, um, in our own projects, mainly our development deals and some in our peer-to-peer -peer loans. Um, I think I've got a little bit in our equity deals, but yeah, I've, I've, you know, there's some good companies out there. I've, I've got a little bit of money um, invested with Funding Circle, and I think with Lend Invest as well, who are a, a very good peer-to-peer -peer property company. Oh, okay, so you do, you do a bit of uh, outside crowdfunding. That's that's interesting because a lot of people that I speak to who are running companies don't 
do that because they've got so much vested into their own uh, companies. But I think it's good to also know what's going on with the other companies and having a little bit of money out there is not a bad thing. Well, it, it, it is. I mean, I'm talking very small amounts because essentially, you know, it's, it's good to see what other companies are doing, how they process things, how they look after their customers and, you know, to pick, pick up on ideas. And both, both those companies I mentioned, do, I, I believe, do things very well and there's things we can learn from them. So. Absolutely. So, Fraser, you launched the House Crowd in 2012 and it was one of the first companies of its kind in the UK as far as uh, crowdfunding goes and equity investing in property. Did you have a, get a difficult time getting people to buy into this concept since you were the first of its kind? Um, yeah, we did. I mean, we were actually the first in the world when we started. Um, I think Fundrise in America, Kate, was the first in America, and that came along several months after us. So we were, you know, without blowing our own trumpet, we were trailblazers. We, we didn't have a roadmap to follow. We were making it up as we went along to some extent. And certainly part of the process um, initially and to some extent now is educating people you know it's still even though we've been going five years when people come and find us for the first time it's new for them so there's still that ongoing education process there's a certain amount of skepticism um, to overcome and really I, th I think the whole industry is still at the very much early adopter stage if you know that that obviously you're familiar with the bell curve where you go well it's probably two or three years I think before it will be accepted into the mainstream. I think, you know, the fact government, the government's promoting crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending. The fact they've um, developed this innovative finance ISA that is when HMRC and the FSCA get their act together will be, be, be released. Um, well, I know a couple of companies have managed to get their authorization, but there's a big queue of other companies like us who are still waiting for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that gives it more mainstream credibility. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the pattern that we found with our investors is that they'll track us for a while, they'll see what, what's going on, they'll monitor activity, and then they dip the toe in the water with a, with a small investment. As someone once said, you know, you don't test the depth of water by jumping in with both feet. People maybe make an investment of one or two thousand pounds, they wait a few months, they see how it goes, are they getting their returns through, and then they'll put a few more in. Conversely, We've had people who track us for 18 months and will call up and put £200,000 into a single investment. Mm -hmm. it's, very it's very nice when that happens. I wish it happened every day. <laughs> um, but it's, it's only ever happened a few times. Um, so, yes, certainly that education process is, is very, very important. One of the questions that I get asked frequently is... Um is about the, the people that are in the US, they want to invest in some of these UK peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending companies. Is the house crowd open to US investors? Um, I'm afraid that US law prevents US citizens from investing in, the, in this sort of investment. Um, I don't, th I, th I think even in America you have to, it may have changed recently, but I think you did have to be an accredited investor and have net assets of over £100,000 even to invest in American crowdfunding platforms, although that that may have changed recently, I'm not sure. So no, we are prohibited from accepting US investment, but pretty much every other country is, is okay. Good old America. Oh, they, <laughs> they have to do everything differently. Well, it's, it's interesting because some of the, actually the UK peer-to-peer uh, -peer companies do accept US, so I'm always a little confused as to why some do and others don't. Maybe it's the equity side of things we can't accept, and maybe peer-to-peer -peer we can. Although I will say, I mean, the American real estate market does tend to provide higher returns than the UK real estate market. I've, I've got a friend who is involved with Patch of Land over there, and I've noticed some of the others like Realty Mogul. You know, they're they're, they're typically paying fixed returns higher than we can offer in the in the UK. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what the benefit would be of a US investor investing in UK property other than perhaps it, they may regard it as being more more secure I'm not sure yeah a, a lot of the times the minimums are very high in America I think fund raises a five thousand dollar per investment minimum so sometimes they just look to diversify with smaller amounts <laughs> right. but a lot of the times they won't yeah it doesn't make much sense um can you explain to me a little bit about how the house crowd chooses the properties that they offer to the investors yeah, certainly. We, um, I think we're probably the only company that offers both equity and peer-to-peer -peer lending. So we offer three, essentially three different types of product. One 
is an assured rental buy to let product that is rented to a corporation that um, basically signs a five-year contract with us on a fixed rental basis and covers all maintenance costs. Um, so we choose that basically on, on the yield and the, we, we only choose properties that have a yield of at least nine and a half percent. So um, that's how we choose our buy to let stock. The loans we make, the peer to peer loans are secured either by a first or second charge um, against the property. We only lend up to 75% on a first charge or 70% on a second charge. Um, and there's, there's various other criteria for those loans that we, we feel that that 70, 75% level um, provides a reasonable level of security, especially given the, the rate of returns that we're, we're paying. Um, and then the developments, we all the developments we currently do are, we control them, so we act as the development company as well. We employ the contractors via our, our development arm, and we do that um, to ensure we have control over it and the types of development um, we choose. We do big feasibility studies on them, and we choose, um, you know, mid mid market areas, mid market properties that we believe are going to be reasonably liquid um, and sell quickly, hopefully off plan. And they need to be in the Greater Manchester area, um, so we can we can monitor them. We have we've got a, a Rick Surveyor as our, our fund monitor who ne he needs to be able to visit the property, the developments on a on a pretty much weekly basis mm -hmm. and check check that everything is progressing properly and the correct amount of money is released to the contractors. So that that's really our criteria for the three different types of products we offer. This is just a purely curious question, quite selfishly, that I ask you this. I've always had this fantasy of working in a bank so I can see how much other people have in their bank accounts and cry <laughs> at my own balance. <laughs> What's, what has been the largest investment put into the house crowd in, in by one single uh, investor, if you don't mind sharing? Um, well, I, I won't mention any names. There have been a few that have invested around a couple of hundred thousand in a single project. Um, oh, so what's this? So Skype's asking me to sign out, which I don't want to do. Um, so there's, a, there's a, been a few large chunks like that. We did we did have one person who put five hundred thousand in, but it turned out he put an extra naught on the end, and it was actually only fifty thousand, <laughs> which was rather disappointing. But there wow, you go. Wow. Um, and then we've got a we've got a, a few investors who've invested, been with us years now, and in total over a number of different projects, have, have invested over eight hundred thousand. There's probably three or four of those. Um, so some quite, you know, quite sizable investments, really. I think one of the things I'm most proud of is we do seem to generate this very, very strong customer loyalty where people are coming back to us time and time again. We've got hundreds of people who've invested with us 10 times or more now. So to me, that says we're doing something right, at least. What, what is the minimum investment amount that you that uh, is needed to get into the house crowd? Well, we started off with a thousand pounds, and we've debated lowering it every now and again. And we have resolutely decided not to, after talking to various other people about the problems they've had when they've invested it. The, so we, we've stuck at a thousand pounds, essentially um, minimum investment. We also, if, in some cases, on development deals, offer higher returns for people who make larger investments of ten thousand pounds or more. Um, but uh, you know, once you're involved with crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending, and you you understand the administrative burden it creates and the regulatory burden it creates, um, you'll understand why we need to limit it to that. It, it is very burdensome, and it, it doesn't make sense for us to make it any less than that. Fraser, in your book that you mention, one of the things that I talk about a lot on the website, um, director experience, and you also mention that it's essential that investors know who are the people running the companies. Uh, mm -hmm. that they're investing through. I, I think this is often a really overlooked point. Um, lenders and investors tend to focus so much on the products and, and on the interest return rate that they are expected to receive that they often overlook who exactly is running the com companies and what the experience of these directors are. Do you think that's a valid concern now that there's so many crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer companies out there? I think it absolutely is. I mean, we started this business from a property perspective. You know, we, we come, both my business partner and I come from a property background, as do some of the other companies out there. Others don't. They come from a tech background um, or they're 
you know, they could be accused of perhaps jumping on the bandwagon and just think, thinking it's a lucrative industry to get into. Um, every investment carries risk and property is no different. Things go wrong. And, you know, you, you're talking when you're talking investments of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in case of our developments, millions of pounds, if things go wrong, it's a very, very serious problem. And if you don't have the experience in property, if you don't have the contacts and the knowledge and expertise to work out solutions to those problems, people are going to end up losing lots of money. You know, we're, we're not infallible. Things have gone wrong with us. We've, we've made mistakes and what have you. But thankfully, and in one particular example, you know, things were very hairy. Um, investors could have ended up losing around half a million pounds due to a third party misappropriating money and it's only really down to the fact that we have the knowledge and experience and the ability to turn that around that you know we had sleepless nights for six months and we, we turned it around nobody lost any money and they will all get paid the returns they were meant to do but if you've just got a platform you, you know you're, you're a software designer who's come up with a crowdfunding platform and putting other people's developments up there how are you going to deal with that problem mm -hmm. You're not. You're going to have no property experience to, to be able to deal with it. So yes, I, d I do think it's it's vital, um, especially you know as as we are now dealing in multi million pound developments. You have to have an experienced team in house that can't have the wool pulled over its eyes by contractors or or anybody else. So yeah, I, th I think it is vital. One of the other things too that I preach about is I personally believe that platform failure is the single biggest risk that people that are investing in to peer-to-peer -peer lending and, and crowdfunding will experience. Um, obviously, one of the main premise behind that is what is the company's ability to operate profitably over a period of time? Um, some of these larger companies have venture capital funds behind them to where they continue to operate at a loss. I don't know how long they can do that for. You mentioned before that the House Crowd is a profitable company. How long have you been profitable for Fraser? Um, probably about the last nine nine months. Um, well, not not massively. But I don't stress not not massively profitable. But we cover our overheads and make a small profit, and that that profit is increasing month on month. I mean, we. Um, We've increased our overheads considerably by employing more staff, which has pushed things up. We spend all our excess money on marketing, but essentially, you know, last month we raised 3.6 million. Um, we're making around a 5% margin on that. So that's around 150, whatever, 100, possibly as much as 180,000 pounds last month. Um, our overheads are a fraction of that. So, you know, it's, that was a particularly good month, but most months we are making a small profit. Um, as you say, some of our competitors that have been backed by by VC money are making very substantial losses, and who knows how long they can sustain that for. We adopted a different model where we haven't had a large amount of investment in, um, and we want to build it up. We may not be as growing as quickly as, especially companies in America are doing. We've had a huge venture capital in, in, input, um, but I think we're growing in a very sustainable way, perhaps more in line with a, a traditional business, not so much like a, a, a fintech or prop tech business is expected to grow, but we find that that's more sensible. And also, you know, a business partner, Sahail and I, we didn't take any money out of this company for the first two, two years. You know, we were living off our, our income from private investments and what have you. Um, take don't still don't take very much out. Our value in this company is in our equity. Now, you know, I don't really want to give away that. You know, we both maintain a, a fairly sizable chunk of equity in the company. That's that's our reward for kind of working several years without being paid and taking the risks of doing it. So I'm not in a big hurry to accept large amounts of investment, um, just in order to to make the company grow like that. I think we're growing quickly enough. And also, as I said, I, I think. Some of our competitors in this country, at least, you know, they they got a large amount of money invested in them. They spent a heck of a lot of money on marketing, and I think they jumped the gun to some extent. I think, as we mentioned, we're still in that early adopter stage where people need to be educated. They're just blind to your billboards and your TV adverts and what have you because they they don't know about the industry yet. So it's not a case of them just choosing one company above another. They don't know about the industry. They need to be educated about it before they can make that choice. And they need to be ready for it as well. You know, people are naturally very skeptical about 
putting their money into anything they find on the internet. You know, there's, there's lots of scams out there, so they, they do need to be careful. Um, so, yeah, I've lost track of what, <laughs> what I was talking about okay. now. <laughs> no, it was, uh, we were just talking about, you know, the profitability of the house crowd. And so it sounds like you're on a projected sort of uptick to where the company can survive long term with we, look, what's we, going we, on right now. We've grown at least 100% a year for the last um, three years. So I think the, the third three years ago it was significantly more than that. But the last two years it's been about 100%. Um, and that's what we're forecasting for the next couple of years. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, we intend to remain profitable. That's good news. You know, before you were talking about the people are very skeptical about the internet and investing through that, I actually found a website a few weeks ago that was a scam crowdfunding website set up by somebody in Nigeria. So they do, they do actually exist out there, believe it. It's really, it was very funny. A lot of the um, warning signs were there, like the misspelled words and yeah. the names of the people running the company and the About Us page were ridiculous, but I thought that was very funny. So obviously there's a few other competitors out there who are offering equity property investments and some of them have, have been a little poor in their performance as far as some of the properties haven't been performing very well. Mm -hmm. How, are the house crowds projected and realized returns pretty much what you thought they were going to be or have they varied much? Well, we started off offering fixed 6% returns, so all those returns have been paid. Um, when we went to variable returns on the kind of traditional terraced housing stock, um, to be frank, they were they were very variable. It's very, very, you're dealing at the low end of the market where you're typically getting five, £550 a month rent. That means every little thing that goes wrong with those properties, you know, a broken washing machine, a a smashed kitchen which happens unbelievably frequently damages tenants absconding without paying the rent legal fees it eats in disproportionately to the rental income so we did find that the yields were massively variable so much so and they're giving us so many headaches that we've stopped offering them all together mm -hmm. and we're now focused on all our investments are now focused on delivering predictable and consistent returns and since we started doing that everything has delivered pretty much, um, I would say pretty much 100%, certainly the Assured Rental portfolio, which we now do, I mentioned earlier, has delivered absolutely 100% as forecast. Um, some of the peer-to-peer -peer loans have not been redeemed on time, but no one's lost any money. And in fact, if there's penalty interest to pay, they've actually got a better return than they thought they would. Um, and no, no one's had to wait more than a few weeks, more than expected to get their returns back. Um, the development loans, no one has lost any money on those and everyone has got their returns as expected. Though with, with developments, you have to be aware things can be delayed for all manner of reasons. And if you're desperately gonna need your money back on the stated date, you that may not be possible, it may be delayed by a few months, but you continue to earn your interest at the same time. The only two projects where people have lost money were both in the same building. They were marketed as highly speculative. They were off-plan investments that were dependent upon the capital growth for people to make their returns. Now, I can't tell you how much we stress this was an incredibly risky investment, much more, it's kind of out, out of the ballpark of what we usually do. We bought those, there were two apartments in Sutton, just outside London. They were dependent on the market rising for all sorts of reasons, other developments being built, Brexit, what have you, the market softened and didn't continue to go up as was anticipated. So we had to sell those very quickly when they came to completion um, because people had only put their deposit monies down and unfortunately people did lose money on, mm -hmm. on those. Um, but I think by and large, they accepted the fact that it was you know, almost akin to a gamble in a way. Sure. They could have made they could have made three or four times their money. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for them. Um, you know, I, I think I, I've been in situations like that. Um, sometimes you you win, sometimes you don't. I think you have to take it on the chin. But you know, I wish we hadn't done them because it doesn't. I don't like people to lose money. Right. And it doesn't particularly reflect well on us. So we, we steer away from now. And as I said, we're totally focused on investments that put money in your pocket, 
cash flow rather than anything to do with capital growth, which, you know, is speculative. We can't control the market. It's completely beyond our control. Mm -hmm. um, and all you can do is hazard a guess. But you can, if you invest in a peer-to-peer -peer loan, you can expect to get the stated return and you should be getting it. So that's what we focus on now. Okay. I, and I appreciate the transparency about some of the struggles that you faced. I think that makes the company more human. Um, when you speak to a company and they say, oh, we've never lost any money and everything's rosy 100% of the time, it's almost becomes too unbelievable. So I think, you know, having that experience, uh, unfortunately, nobody wants to lose money, but it happens in property development. So um, I think it's good you've been transparent about that. We do, we do publish our um, performance stats every month on the website for people to see. So okay. welcome to go and look. Excellent. That is good news. Fraser, where do you see the property market heading in the next 12 months? Um, I, th I think it's very uncertain terms. I, I, I mean, I, I don't really think there is a property market. I think there are various regional markets and even within that, you know, prices in certain areas of Manchester have increased massively in, you know, pl places like um, I mean, Didsbury or, or around here where we are, we are in Hale has increased by, I think, 17% over the last 12 months mm -hmm. um, whereas other areas remain completely flat and some areas like prime London have, have gone down significantly so I don't think there is one property market but if you were to take you know your average property in your average area I would say there's probably too much uncertainty about um, too many changes to legislation and stamp duty and things like that investors pulling it and landlords pulling out of the market I, I you know there may be very small increases in your average property price but I, I don't think we're going to see any significant changes in the next 12 months what is the single biggest challenge that, that the house crowd faces as a company at the moment um, I think it's managing growth you know we, we've had offers of investment and we we haven't, as I said, we haven't particularly wanted to take them on. We're, we're now at about, we've grown in five years from three of us working from, you know, our, our, our bedrooms, basically, our spare bedrooms, to a company that's now got over 20 people employed. And I, I personally find that very difficult to manage that number of people. Um, and just manage, managing the growth of the company and the culture of the company because we're, we're a very friendly company, you know, everyone comes here, I, th I think everyone enjoys coming to work, but I think as you grow and you employ more people, it becomes a lot harder to maintain that culture mm -hmm. and keep, keep the good staff on board. Um, so that for me is the biggest challenge. Um, I think probably as a company, it's, it's the regulation, it's perhaps having to cope with a crowdfunding company um, having a disaster and going you know going out of business or people losing money and that affecting people's perception um, which is is something we we have in the background and we've sort of prepared to what what we would do in that situation um, because you know it's not you can't really predict it and there's not really a lot you can do about a third party so I, I would say as far as internally goes it, it's it's managing the company's growth and not getting carried away um, with it and just, just managing it in a sustainable way. Fraser, you had mentioned before about the public's perception of the alternative finance sector, how it's still a relatively young sector. Um, a lot of people don't really know what it is. I think it was Lord Turner's comments, I always mention this, that probably put a lot of more people off of the sector and then he turned around and, of course, went back on that comment. Oh, did he? I, di I didn't. I didn't know he went back on it. Oh yeah, yeah. He t he turned around and and tried to restate what he had said, and some of the things he said didn't come out the right way. But um, I certainly don't think that helped the sector at all. You you had mentioned that you still think it's going to take another two or three years for the public to become familiar and comfortable. Do you think that that's going to happen after two to three years, or do you think it may take longer than that? Um. I don't know. I, I don't have a, a crystal ball. I can only see the way things are going. I mean, it's, you know, I, I read the University of Cambridge and Nesta reports every year. It's clearly growing at a quite phenomenal rate, but it's still only a small percentage of people. I think it's, a, I think I'm maybe right in saying it's only about a million people have invested in crowd crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending so far in the UK. Um, 
most people I meet in a business capacity aren't even aware that property crowdfunding exists. Um, so it's, it's getting it out there. I don't know. I would say too, to if you look at the the mass solution research that's gone into it, they they believe globally the industry is going to be worth about two hundred and fifty billion by the end of two thousand and twenty. Um, you know, that's a pretty sizable industry. So I, I would say at that stage, if that's reflected proportionately in the UK, it, it's pretty wide widespread. Um, I, th I don't know. I mean, I think for a lot of people, I, I guess myself included, making equity investments in startup or um, early stage companies is incredibly risky because even if the company is successful, you don't know what you're going to get as a shareholder and how, how much your shares are being diluted. I think property crowdfunding is a different beast altogether. I think there's a reason why it's far and away the most popular sector in crowdfunding is that people, especially in the UK, love property. They understand it as an asset class. It's not difficult to understand. You know, you run a company, there's so many complications and you don't know what decisions those directors are going to make. If you're building a house to sell it or building a house or, or buying a house to rent it, it's pretty straightforward. Everyone can get their head around that. And if as long as you're dealing with people who know what they're doing and do it well, I'm not saying there's nothing can go wrong, but there's a lot less that can go wrong with doing that than there is with a startup company. So I think it's a lot more secure for most people and of course if things do go wrong the chance of that property being worth nothing in 12 months time are very very slim whether whereas the chances of a startup company being worth nothing in 12 months time are very high yeah. so it's a completely different ball game i think property crowdfunding to the to the rest of the industry yeah and then the security is always a very important part of of any pit to pit loan and as long as you have a good security that isn't leveraged too high um, I, I don't think you're in a bad position and as long as fraud hasn't occurred that seems to be one of the other things that some of the peer-to-peer -peer companies face with the loans uh, is, is the fraud so well you, you mentioned Nigeria um, and you know I don't think it's been racist in any way shape or form because the the, the official statistics show that Nigeria does have a very high rate of corruption and, and fraud that, that, yeah. that simply is a fact and you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had to pull out of a deal where we were going to grant a, a, a £400,000 loan um, secured against a house in London that we knew was owned by a foreign company, it was a Nigerian company. But this company hadn't filed their up to date annual return, which lists the directors and the shareholders. So we had no way of knowing whether these people who were purporting to be the sole directors and shareholders, they were directors and shareholders, we weren't necessarily the sole ones, or they might not be at that stage because they hadn't found their annual return. So there's lots of kicking and screaming going on, but you know they couldn't provide us with the evidence they'd filed their statutory return. So we, we had to pull out of it because I'm not saying there was fraud. I'm just saying we couldn't be sure there wasn't, and so we had to we had to pull out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just can't take that risk too because you've got other people's money involved, and it's absolutely. not worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want you to take your the house crowd biased hat off here for a second if you would mm -hmm. i ask this to everybody that comes on the podcast now within alternative finance investment sector as a whole on a scale of one to ten one being the riskiest i'm sorry on a scale of one to ten one being <laughs> the safest ten yeah. being the riskiest now if you're objective where do you put the house crowd on that as an investment risk scale for somebody who's looking to invest I would, I would have to say about a three. Three. I mean, there are risks. There's no getting away from them. Um, we can do everything we can to mitigate them, but you know, they, they still exist. Um, not necessarily that you would lose all, all your money, but that things can go wrong. And it, there may be delays in making payments, or that, that you may not get the return you you, you expected. I, th I think the. The risk of losing all your money is extremely small, but the, the risk of something going wrong and it not turning out quite as expected is probably around a three. Okay, that's very objective, Fraser. If you had an imaginary best friend and they said to you, Fraser, I want to put some money into crowdfunding, but I don't know how much, or peer to peer lending as a whole, what would you tell that person as far as what you would advise the percentage of liquid net worth and i know this is obviously varies depending on people's situations but let's just say they're a very average situation 
uh, average Joe person on the street, what would you advise that person to do? Okay, well, firstly, how did you know I had an imaginary best friend? Well, every, that's, meant to be, that, that's meant to be a secret. <laughs> <laughs> and my imaginary, very, very, my imaginary best friend is a highly intelligent and sophisticated investor, so I'd, I'd let him make his own decisions. But if he was just um, on your average person on the street, I mean, the, the official guide, guidance is that people should not be investing more than 10% of their net assets in alternative investments. Um, that to me sounds a little a little bit like doctors recommending how much alcohol you should drink. It's just based on personal opinion. Um, I think what's 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 right for people very much depends upon that. I wouldn't actually give anybody any advice because it very much depends upon their attitude to risk. They certainly should not invest more than they could afford to lose. So if they, something drastic did happen and they lost their money, um, it shouldn't be causing them any hardship. Um, I just think they need to set their criteria and establish what risk they are prepared to accept um, and then do their due diligence and also diversify and spread whatever available money they have to invest over a number of different investments. And that doesn't necessarily mean different types of investments. I'm not necessarily a big fan of diversifying over stocks, shares, gold, stamps, fine wines, whatever. I, I just don't think you can know that much about all those different areas. But you can diversify within one asset class that you do know and understand and appreciate. So you could have some some higher risk, some lower risk, and have a blend within property, say, as an asset class. Uh, certainly, what 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 I tend to do with my own personal money. Um, but you know, I, I I would not. I just wouldn't give advice to anyone as to how much to do. I'd point out what they should be considering and let them make their own decision. Okay, that's fair enough. It's just something I always like to ask and, and get a viewpoint on because everybody has a different answer for that. Some people say 10%, some people say 25%, 30%. And I, just, I get emailed that question so much and people don't really know what they should be doing. And I, I'm also a person that doesn't like to advise people because everybody's situation different. Somebody who's 21 years old has a lot more time to recover from a, a financial loss than somebody who's 60, so... Um, yeah, and, 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 and different goals as well. You know, I was, I was just talking to one of our chaps today about the, the power of compound interest. And if you start investing at the age of 21 and reinvest that interest, it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. to the amount you'll end up with when you're 60. I mean, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of difference if you start off with, say, 20,000 pounds. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have a very different goal from someone. And we have a lot of elderly investors who just want the cash flow. They want to give themselves an annual or a monthly or quarterly or annual income. And that's all they want. They're not interested in, in growth of the money. They just need the money to live off. So, you know, they, they perhaps need to invest, have more of their money invested in safer things to provide them with with the level of income. So I just w I would explain to people what they need to consider and let them make their own decisions. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. And, and Fraser, I love the fact that you touched on compound interest. I write about this all the time. I'm a huge fan of uh, low cost, low fee investing, things like index trackers, because, you know, a half percent fee on something like a unit trust or a mutual fund can make such a difference over 20 or 30 years. And it, it just seems so so insignificant, but it could be such a massive amount of money. So I really yeah. love that you talked about that. Thank you. So, kudos, kudos. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Can you share anything to the uh, listeners about future house crowd plans, innovations, maybe new products that you're rolling out in the future anything else that you'd like to tell the listeners about the house crowd yeah sure well at the moment we offer three three products i said the assured buy to let peer-to-peer -peer lending and the, the development loan products um so we've got a number of potential other innovative products in the pipeline um we're looking to introduce a mini bond product which will have a period of um probably three years where you just get a fixed rate that you just put your money in, you can put it in wherever you like, and you just get a fixed rate of interest for the three years, and then you can withdraw it on, say, three months' notice after that period. So a lot of our, a lot of our investors do like looking at the individual property information for each one and making their own decisions as to what they lend money against or what they invest their money in. Other people don't have the time. They just want to return on their money, so that product is, is aimed for them. Um, we've got... 
a very interesting equity product, hopefully coming along that will produce very massively high yields. Um, I mean, just unbelievably high that we are in talks with um, various bodies about how we go about pr providing this. And I, I don't, really want, don't really want to talk more about that other than it would be a council backed investment where the council will be paying the rent on behalf of a certain um, segment, vulnerable section of the po population for us to house them. And we're in talks with Manchester Council about, about doing that. And that will produce a very high yield for investors. Um, and hopefully, as I said, when the F FCA and HMRC get their act together, we'd love to be able to introduce an in in innovative finance ISA product um, that will enable people to earn very decent returns um, in a very tax efficient way. So that, that's certainly a big part of our roadmap, but that's out of our hands at the moment. It's probably going to be next year before we can introduce that. The slow wheels of the FCA machine are <laughs> turning even slower at the moment, sounds like. Well, they are, apparently they had their hands tied with all the RBS, Williams and Glynn thing, and now that's not going ahead. It's actually freed them up to um, do what we paid them for 19 <laughs> months ago. <laughs> yeah, that, that is funny, isn't it? Because the FCA is funded by the companies that are the members, correct? Mm, yes. But don't get me just, Lawrence. I won't. Uh, don't get me started on the uh, FCA, I please. Will, I, <laughs> I, need to, I need to bite my tongue here. <laughs> Yeah, you never know how many of them are listening ready to, to find mm. everybody. Okay, so Fraser, again, thank you for coming on the show. A couple of other things before we end. Give me a good lawyer joke. A good lawyer joke? Oh, my God. Um, what's the difference between a good lawyer and a bad lawyer? I have no idea. A bad lawyer will can let a, drag, a case drag out for several years. A good lawyer can make it last even longer. <laughs> there you go that, that is excellent i like that it's all about the delivery and the timing isn't it when it comes to jokes yeah neither of which i'm good at but there you go <laughs> it just takes practice no that was a good one i, I def I'll, I'll give you about a, a seven and a half on that one so okay i like very good. that okay so again if you want to to uh pick up the book fraser has written it's called the alternative guide to property investment um where can people get the book fraser um, well, it's going to be published on April the 24th um, on, on Amazon. So, Fraser, thank you again for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule to come on and painfully talk about the Dragon's Den. And uh, I, I really wish you the best of luck. I've, I haven't personally invested in into the house crowd, but it's definitely something that I'm going to look into and uh, possibly review on the website when that happens several months down the road. I think it's very innovative product that you're offering and I, I'm very much a, as they say in the US, bullish on the uh, equity property investing side and sector. So thanks again for joining us and I wish you the best of luck with everything that you're doing and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. You've been listening to the Financial Thing Peer-to-Peer -peer Lending Essentials Podcast. Don't forget to visit financialthing.com for all the latest peer-to-peer -peer lending reviews and DIY investing.